And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. John Alexander Sider. Uh, really putting together an introduction like this is a bit tricky in the night circles. Um, so many times we ask the speaker to, to tell you about their achievements. They're, with the spirit of humility, you often get a woefully incomplete act, uh, account of, of what they've done. But unfortunately, given my proximity to Bluffton, as well as connections to active members here, I've had a chance to hear quite a bit about what we might expect to see. Um, Dr. Snyder is a professor of religion and director of the Peace and Conflict Studies uh, program here at Bluffton University and has a truly world class academic pedigree. While completing graduate work at Purdue Key Study extensively with Stanley uh, Harwas, who was cited by Time Magazine in 2001 as America's best theologian. Perhaps more directly the point of our discussion here, in fact, Sider's formal academic successes have uh, not gotten in the way of pursuing an interesting and diverse research agenda. His dissertation uh, was revised and published in 2011 as a book uh, entitled To See History Doxological. I hear this both remarkable and rather dense, um, but it's hard to find, it works at, uh, at uh, finding how to understand what is broken and damaged in church and how to still be holy in that uh, broken and damaged state. The ideas of renewal through brokenness and reliance on God have certainly shared a significant overlap with those of us in healthcare and our efforts to be healers. He's currently uh, uh, doing work surrounding medical ethics and enablement both as part of his larger research agenda and as a core part of what he does here teaching at Washington University. Uh, that all leads perhaps to what is the most impressive endorsement I've heard about Dr. Sun. Uh, he is an exceptional uh, academic, academic admission uh, by any measure, but it is his teaching that really makes him stand out uh, in, his, in his experience in the classroom. He is both loved and respected by his peers and student body for the quality of his teaching. I've heard stories uh, both as a teacher and learner with the preparation and passion that allows them to be flexible and, and lecture on a range of topics, man of Adventist history, gaming culture, making Germanic practices that have become part of our Christian celebrations. Indeed, it is this skill I look forward most from hearing from uh, Professor Alex Sider, who will speak to us now about how to think about, frame, and react to brokenness. Please join me in welcoming him as he presents our opening session, Amid the Pains, Christian, I'm not going to use the point of the mouse because uh, I was losing it on the screen, so I'm just going to have the keyboard here. Uh, the band sings a little more uh, clearly. I'm also a little worried. Uh, usually when I teach in this room, I pace all over the place um, and manage to trip over things. So uh, that gener generally generates a good laugh from people, but it's a little more dangerous tonight. <laughs> Well, thank you for this uh, invitation uh, to speak, and um, it's nice to be here. Uh, this is a this is um, this work that I have been putting together for a long, long time, um, and what I noticed most about it while I put it together for for this presentation is that uh, it's still pieces here and pieces there um, that I think are coherent, but. Um, I'll beg your indulgence. So, with that, I'll hop, I'll hop right in. Modern Israel's greatest poet, Yehuda Amakai, died in the year 2000. That same year, his translators, Chana Block and Chana Kronfeld, published Open, Closed, Open, a collection of Amakai's poetry, which won the 2001 Penn Award for Poetry and Translation. Open, Closed, Open included Amakai's poem, The Precision of Pain, from which I take my title today. Here's the poem. The precision of pain and the blurriness of joy. 
I'm thinking how precise people are when they describe their pain in a doctor's office. Even those who haven't learned to read and write are precise. This one's a throbbing pain. That one's a wrenching pain. This one gnaws. That one burns. This is a sharp pain. And that, a dull one. Right here. Precisely here. Yes. Yes. Joy blurs everything. I've heard people say after nights of love and feasting, it was great. I was in seventh heaven. Even the spacemen that floated in outer space, tethered to a spaceship, could only say, great, wonderful. I have no words. The blurriness of joy and the precision of pain. I want to describe with a sharp pain's precision happiness and blurry joy. I learned to speak among the paintings. A yellow newsprint clipping of this poem hangs from my office door, and I think about some aspect of it nearly every day, even if it's only to repeat that last line, I learned to speak among the paintings. I especially like the tone of the poem, the exuberance that builds into the beginning of line six, as Anakai describes the experience of being in pain with increasing intensity and focus, throbbing, wrenching, gnawing, burning. Here's something I can pinpoint. Here's something I can locate. Here's something I can communicate about myself. And I know because you can find my pain too. Right here. Precisely here. Yes. Yes. The interplay between the intensity of pain experienced and the rising excitement of the prospect and success of communicating that pain strikes me as an altogether accurate evocation of what it is like, often, to be in pain. There's this nearly imperceptible oscillation back and forth between suffering and relief at being heard. Then in the poem, the subtle emotional deflation that follows Amakai as he turns his attention to joy. Blurred perception. Land description. Great. Seven seven. Wonderful. I have no words. And third, a quick twist of the screw that's bitter and ironic. Describing Amakai's desire to voice joy with the same intense specificity he can conjure, conjure when he speaks of pain. And then lastly, the slightful, slightly rueful admission about when and where he learned to speak. Of course it makes sense, Amakai says, that I'm no good at speaking my pain or that I am so good at speaking my pain, and yet so inept at naming joy, I learned to speak among the pains. Well, this poem structures most of my thinking and experience regarding questions about religion and health, and not least about the stressed three-way intersection among Christianity in its taught and lived dimensions, disability in its theoretical and experiential dimensions, and healing, which is for many of us as often dimensioned in disappointment as it is in hope. The poem structures as well the dynamic to which I'd like to attend in this talk, namely to the in-between of disability and healing. What do I mean by the in-between? This is the Jewish social theorist and political philosopher Jillian Rose, who described it well in her memoir, Love's Work, which she wrote while she was dying of metastatic ovarian cancer at the age of 48. Rose began Love's Work with an epigraph from St. Saluan of Athos. If you haven't heard of Saloon, he was a early 20th century Orthodox monk who received in ecstasy a vision of Christ. And then, when the vision faded, 
lapsed into a 15 year long major depressive episode. At the end of which, he says, God granted him assurance in the form of a saying, keep your mind in hell and despair not. Love's work, Rose's memoir, is part philosophy, part theology, part memoir, and its title is ambiguous, deliberately so, I suggest. It may be possessive, the work of love, or it might be a contraction, love is work. Anyone who attempts to write honestly about love or life will know that it's no field for, for soupy platitudes or facile moralizing. Love and life are also not fields for, that are mm, accepting, let's say, of predetermined outcomes. If there was one thing Rose couldn't stand, it was the faith that people often put in predetermined outcomes. She recognized the persist persistent structure in human thinking that pits two justifiably justifiable but, but incompatible claims against each other. And then in the structure of thinking often dictates how that controversy will work itself out. Within contemporary Christian thought, you might recognize such an opposition as that which is often proposed between faith and reason, or love and justice, or faithfulness and effectiveness, or science and religion. Such inquiries are almost without exception or You know how they will work themselves out before you ever engage them. Their purpose, moreover, is rarely to grapple with the question of how to speak truthfully about the world. Instead, it's usually to reinforce the perspective that you or others already hold on different grounds. And I ask you to consider what it's like to have a perspective that you already hold reinforced by someone else. Words like validating vindicating, or even stabilizing come to mind. But, as we can easily see in our polarized political climate, feeling validated in one's views, sorry, <laughs> because of your camaraderie with others, is really quite different than grappling truthfully with the perspectives of those who disagree with you. It's a way of repairing a relationship without having to engage it. And this is what Rose couldn't stand, that we repair relationships without, without engaging them. Against this ideology of repair, Rose argued for the integrity of the in-between. Human lives, she insisted, are often marked by difficulties that can't be easily ameliorated. If we're to live and love truthfully, Rose said, it will only be by committing to the long and potentially unrewarding work of peacemaking mediation, which, just as often as not, involves living into and with irreconcilable differences. Now, if I were going to reflect on Rose at more length, I would have a lot to say about the challenge that her view of the in-between, or as she calls it elsewhere, the broken middle, poses to contemporary Christian understandings of peace of conflict, of forgiveness, of reconciliation. But here, I want to reflect on the commitment to the in-between in terms of Christian responses to disability, particularly as they're filtered through stories of healing. Christian narratives about human illness and impairment often leave persons with disabilities with two options, either miraculous healing or heroic suffering. And these narratives create the impression that with great faith or effort, persons with disabilities can overcome physical limitations and social barriers. But these same narratives often ignore discrimination and disabling social policies. Tonight, I'll explore some resources within the Christian tradition for speaking about human illness, impairment, and disability by extension, healing, 
as fundamental matters of social justice. But part and parcel of any exploration of subjects as fraught as disability and Christianity and feeling is work to create shared understanding of ideas and concepts. We have to hold some conceptualizations in common in order to avoid simple misunderstanding. And because the topics with which we're dealing are complex and sensitive, we have to hold understandings in common also to avoid giving offense. I don't propose to have the final word on any of the definitions I'm about to talk with you about, but I want you to understand how I'm using them, if for no other reason than to provide a basis for further conversation and consideration. So in the next few minutes, we'll discuss Six terms that are essential for framing Christian theological engagement with experiences of disability. I've arranged the list in order of complexity. That's to say, I've begun with the concepts that are basic for this discourse and built towards concepts that depend for their intelligibility on those basic concepts. So we begin with impairment which is sometimes used interchangeably with disability, but which most disability studies scholars say should be distinguished from it. In fact, when we use the term impairment as a synonym for disability, as in the phrase mobility impaired or vision impaired, we're actually often engaging in the use of a euphemism that feels less stigmatizing than terms like handicap or even disabled. But most disability theorists suggest that impairment signifies a diminishment in function or ability when measured against the typical benchmark. But while disability involves the conversion of impairment into an obstacle, that is to say, disability names both the condition of impairment plus its negative social consequences. In 1980, for instance, the World Health Document, International Classification of Impairments, Disabilities, and Handicaps, or ICIDH for short, defined impairment as any loss or abnormality of psychological, physiological, or anatomical structure or function. And it correspondingly defined disability as any restriction or lack resulting from an impairment or ability to perform an activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. The emphasis on restriction is important. While my broken leg might impair me, it only becomes disabling on this definition when I need to climb a flight of stairs that someone has put in my way. The concept of impairment, according to social theorist Michael Ralph, did not, however, originate in connection with modern medicine for disability activism. Instead, it began with changes in the US life insurance industry that followed upon the abolition of slavery in 1865. Ralph argued that as a term, impairment served to condense several different classes of risk including region, race, family medical history, and national origin, in a way that avoided language that suddenly conflicted with the imperative to form an ostensibly free society. By the 1890s, when states began to adopt anti-discrimination laws, insurance underwriters <coughs> continued to charge African Americans higher rates for life insurance than they charged whites and they did so by reclassifying the risks associated with insuring African Americans as ones due to mental impairment. So, Ralph continues, the concept of impairment thus emerged from the scientific assessments of medical experts, actuaries, and underwriters concerned to fix the monetary value of social difference and debility. Turning their attention to family medical history, blood and urine samples, and emerging physiological indices like blood pressure, scientists established 
medical impairment as the ground for differentiating between demographics. In the process, the hierarchical calculus of value that was explicit in the context of legalized enslavement now became the basis for private medical assessments. These scientific developments effectively privatized inequality. I quote Ralph at length because his analysis serves as a useful reminder that like disability, the concept of impairment is a construction that depends on social arrangements and expectations. It is not a neutral description, but one forged in the fires of policy debate and the drive to monetize the value of human life. The struggle to define impairment over the decades has had positive consequences for some people and negative dehumanizing ones for others. I've already given one description of the term disability impairment plus its negative social consequences. And that description expresses what Rachel Adams, Benjamin Reese, and David Serlin call a central tenet of disability studies. That disability is produced as much by environmental and social factors as it is by bodily conditions. Because many of you work in healthcare professions, you will no doubt be used to encountering the myriad ways that bodies and their social environments interact. You will probably also be more accustomed than many audiences to considering the fact that such interactions are not stable across space and time. What is considered disabling in one context may not be considered disabling in another. Indeed, disability is situational. So some Down syndrome researchers and activists, for instance, have noted that Down syndrome as a disability depends often on what aspects of a person's life one is considering. There may be social consequences that often attach to a DS diagnosis in terms of things like access to employment, obtaining a driver's license, managing personal finances, and so on. But a person with a DS diagnosis will typically not experience that diagnosis as a defining feature of one or family life. And may even enjoy social benefits in terms of higher than typical emotional intelligence quotients. So I admit that the research on that front is controversial. In other words, contrary to what may seem to be common sense, there's no specific set of conditions or impairments that just are disabling, regardless of time, place, and social setting. Yet despite the fact that disability is socially constructed, it tends to provoke a common set of reactions wherever and however it occurs. Nancy Eastland, the author of The Disabled God, which was really um, the, the uh, first text in uh, the sort of subfield of theology and disability. Um, it's a 1994 text, so four years after the publication of the ADA, or of the um, passage of the ADA. Nancy Eastland puts it this way. Although people with disabilities span a broad spectrum of medical conditions with diverse effects on appearance or function, whatever the setting, whether in education, medicine, rehabilitation, social welfare policy, or society at large, a common set of stigmatizing values and arrangements has historically operated against us. We'll move on now to uh, talking about the concept of the medical model of disability. And, and this is important because uh, disability and its history is so multifaceted that we have to make some distinctions and periodizations whenever we discuss it. And one of those distinctions has to do with comparing and contrasting models of disability. Generally, the claim is that in disability studies and public policy, a medical model of disability has been replaced by a social model of disability. 
and that this transition represents a more sophisticated use of the term disability that has positive social consequences for persons with disabilities. But what is the medical model that has been replaced? In essence, the medical model of disability focuses on disability as a set of conditions that accrues to an individual and places him or her in proximity to the medical community as the primary gatekeeper for access to services and accommodations. In other words, on the medical model of disability, a person with a disability is considered sick or diseased and in need of treatment. While it is the case that some persons with disabilities are unhealthy, and that on Likert type scale questionnaires administered in the US, adults with disabilities are four times more likely to, to report their health to be fair or poor than people with no disabilities. It is not the case that disability and illness are synonymous. I say this though with one important caveat, namely, that the line between chronic illness and disability is extraordinarily fuzzy, particularly when one considers acquired disabilities in aging populations, as well as disabilities that are acquired in relation to women's reproductive health. So for instance, women's studies scholar Susan Wendell has argued that the displacement of the medical model of disability by the social model puts persons with both chronic illnesses and disabilities, most of whom are older and or women, at a systematic disadvantage by silencing increased attention to advocacy for medical care in the disability community. I had a side note here about uh, this being one of the one of the reasons that it's important for contemporary Christians to pay attention to Old Testament texts about female infertility. Um, when, we, when we start to think about the, the appearance, if you will, of disability in the Bible, we quickly find out that uh, female infertility in the period of, during which the Old Testament is written, about which it is being written, uh, is, is uh, an impairment that has a an extreme set of social consequences for women. One additional feature of the social model of disability is its emphasis on, uh, I'm sorry, I should back up, to uh, talk about the social model of disability at the, uh, from the get-go. The model of disability that typically gets contrasted with the medical model is the social model which began its ascendancy in the late 1960s as activist groups began to advocate for disability as a positive identity category and thus began to shift public awareness of disability from medical concerns to social justice ones. By the time of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, the disabilities rights movement in the U.S had advanced sufficiently to put perceptions of and social attitudes toward disability in the spotlight. And on the world stage, the 2008 UN Convention of, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities defined disability as resulting from the interactions between persons with impairments and the attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. This definition highlights the basic shift from the medical model. Whereas the medical model treated a person with a disability as an isolated individual in need of treatment, the social model of disability focuses on reshaping society at large through legislation, accommodation, accessibility, and inclusion work, and efforts to address the stigma that has attached to disability and led to disparities and opportunities for persons with disabilities. One additional feature of the social model of disability is its emphasis on perceptions of the world shared by persons with disabilities, which is sometimes called disability subjectivity or even a biocultural model of disability. 
Adams, Reese, and Serling elaborate. While it may be true that to lose one's leg, or to be visually impaired, or to have chronic illness in the 21st century United States is incommensurate with what these impairments or conditions meant in 18th century Europe or ancient Egypt, disability itself always begins and ends with the subjective impressions of the individual who experiences the world through her body. The point here is to note that a person's perceptions are neither a function of the body in isolation nor of the built social environment, but rather of the interplay between the person and his or her societies or environments. We're going to talk about the last uh, two definitions together, cure and healing. While summarizing the medical model of disability, I noted that in it, persons with disabilities were treated as diseased, that is, exhibiting symptoms of a pathological entity, or ill, experiencing a diseased state. In any event, they were treated as standing in need of medical intervention. But when we tra traverse the ground between medicine and religion, we find a distinction arising within religious studies but finding its way into the medical humanities, social sciences, today into narrative medicine and progressive clinical practice between cure and healing. If I were to try to give a full history of this origin, of the origin of this distinction, I'd point to the period between the end of the US Civil War and World War I. And I'd cite two themes that converged in Christian studies around that time. As the Catholic historian David Endress has noted, the first theme arose in response to the advent of the new medicine, including the introduction of the X-ray, the first successful blood transfusion, the discovery of the pain reliever, aspirin, the development of tests for tuberculosis and syphilis, the finding of an antitoxin for diphtheria and tetanus, and the widespread use of surgery to correct ailments including hernia, appendicitis, and tonsillitis. Christians varied in how they viewed such medical advances. Some, like Mary B Baker Eddy and the Christian Science Movement, rejected the claims of modern medicine and created the modern faith healing tradition. While U.S. Catholicism, on the other hand, saw a sharp rise in the number of reported miraculous cures and a correspondingly sharp rise in pilgrimage to shrines associated with such healing. Still other Christians embraced some version of compatibilism, arguing that medical intervention and Christian belief need not be pitted against each other. In any event, it was during this period that American Christians began to distinguish the concept of cure, which may be though not always was a function of medicine, from healing, which is holistic and always in this discourse depends fundamentally on God's grace. And again, just as a side note, the earliest reference that I can find to this distinction uh, in a sort of modern form comes from 1875. The second theme arose in biblical studies, particularly in connection with critical reflection on the ministry of Jesus. Scholars representing Protestant liberalism and the quest for the historical Jesus tended to view the healing ministry of Jesus as depicted in the canonical gospels as a complex set of metaphors. The point of the stories, they argued, was not that Jesus cured blindness, say, but rather that the blind person's faith in Jesus healed him in a holistic, in a spiritual sense. Again, reactions among contemporary Christians varied. Many, buoyed by their newfound trust in the powers of modern medicine, accepted the interpretations of Protestant liberal scholars, while others, caught in the midst of the fundamentalist modernist controversy, rejected such claims as the height of impiety modern unbelief. Interestingly, this distinction between cure and healing arose in Christian literature at a time when medical doctors were still broadly trained in the humanities. 
Thus, there exists an entire literature devoted to explorations of biblical healings, other miracles, by medical professionals. And that literature begins in the 1880s and continues for a solid century. Not incidentally, many of those doctor authors also happen to be Christian missionaries in regions with vibrant indigenous healing traditions. The distinction between healing and cure is important for us today because of the way it's been used to structure Christian narratives about disability. As I noted at the outset of this lecture, Christian stories about human illness and impairment often leave persons with disabilities with two options, miraculous healing, heroic suffering. Far past the passage of the ADA, Christian congregations have principally encountered disability in ways dictated by the medical model. And this has everything to do with the distinction between cure and healing as it shapes contemporary Christian practice, particularly in North America and in regions of the world where modern Christianity was given its fundamental outlines by the American missionary movement. People react weird to people with disabilities like me, said Rich, sitting comfortably in his modern electric wheelchair. They act like a disability is something they can catch, like it's infectious. At church, most people are unable to get past my disability. They stare not at me, but at my disability. This story, excerpted from Minister and Disability Activist Brett Webb Mitchell's book, Beyond Accessibility, is notable principally for its commonness. If you are or know a person with a disability in a Christian congregation, the chances are excellent that you have or have heard a similar story. It may be the case that persons with visible disabilities experience this kind of reaction outside of church, but Christian ableist theologies exacerbate and in some sense license such reactions. I won't go into the characteristics of ableist theology at length here, except to define it as any theology that presumes abled body and by so doing, constructs persons with disabilities as marginalized and largely invisible to others. For ableist theologies, the main encounter with disability in the Christian tradition occurs in biblical narratives where, with a few exceptions, impairments and the disabilities that accompany them are overcome by being cured or healed through the active and miraculous intervention of God. A chief characteristic of ableism in church, then, is that it still thinks of disability as needing a cure, needing healing. And this association means that typically abled Christians are often stuck encountering persons with disabilities along the lines dictated by the medical model. When that happens in congregations, an implicit question is usually being asked. Won't she get better? And as soon as that question gets asked, then you're off on all the usual rabbit trails about the power of prayer, the reality of miracles, the amount of faith people have, God's sovereignty, and the meaning of suffering. None of which, of course, is to see or treat or take the person with the disability as a person. Often, Rather than engaging with people, practitioners of ableist theologies pose questions or conundrums, questions that result in sterile but stabilizing and validating religious discourses that avoid the difficulty of actually encountering people in the in-between, people whose lives are marked by difficulties that cannot be easily overcome and should not be ignored. Against such ableist theologies, I want to sketch three resources that the Christian tradition provides for thinking about disability as, a fu as fundamentally a matter of social justice. Dependency, celebration, and friendship. Each of them could involve much further elaboration than I will give it here. First, dependency. The philosopher Adolf Federer today recently pointed to Mitt Romney's 2012 pres presidential campaign blunder 
of referring to 47% of the U.S. population as dependent. A gaffe that probably contributed to Romney losing, losing the election. And, and Kate pointed to this gap as, as evidence that Americans despise dependence. She also commented on how strange this fact is, given that we are a thoroughly social species for whom dependence on others allows for needed care, knowledge, culture, technology, and political and social and economic goods. Yet it's no secret that stigma attaches to dependency as such in our culture. Where disability is concerned, American cultural disdain for dependency probably, probably continues to contribute to the idea that disability is a social problem. Disdain for dependency even filters into Christian congregations, where human relations are often redefined as interdependent. On the one hand, this move is meant to combat modern narratives of autonomy and independence. On the other, it counters inappropriate forms of dependency. Often, however, it comes at significant cost, namely that of recasting relationships as significant to the degree that they are reciprocal. Of course, relationships of reciprocity stand a good chance of being more just than many non-reciprocal ones. But the idea of interdependence as involving reciprocity still participates in a vision of the common good as essentially competitive, as involving the exchange of goods that are mine rather than yours, or others rather than mine, it has not graduated, one might say, to a vision of goods that are fundamentally non-competitive in nature. Mine only insofar as they are yours, or yours insofar only as they are mine. One major consequence of the emphasis on interdependency in Christian congregations is alienation for persons with disabilities and their families, who often experience it themselves and their loved ones as having little say over the degree to which their relationships are reciprocal or genuinely interdependent. I do not mean to demonize the ideals of independence or even interdependence because their proponents aspire to produce more nearly just societies than we currently enjoy, societies that dismantle systemic privilege wherever it occurs. However, I do think that the Christian tradition offers an alternative to such configurations of relationship, and one that speaks of justice for the most vulnerable among us, including, for instance, persons with profound intellectual disability. In Christian teaching, after all, the question is never, am I dependent or not? I am. But rather, in what ways do I depend on others? And the Christian tradition includes resources for reshaping our perception of dependency as such, and therefore contributing to more just social structures of relationship that include persons with disabilities. One such resource can be found in the writings of the 4th century theologian Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory was concerned that the good end Christians, Gregory was convinced, I'm sorry, that the good end Christians are promised was not a life of reciprocity with God or with others, but one of mutuality. Not give and take or interdependency in the way that idea is often construed today. Gregory, for instance, thought that God was in no way interdependent with creation. But, we might say, Gregory advocated togetherness, varying intensities of dependency, most of which are asymmetrical. That is to say, you are dependent on others in ways in which they may not be dependent on you, and that is simply a typical feature of human lives. Paradigmatically, Gregory insisted, this asymmetrical relationship of dependency describes human creaturely dependence upon God. So with Gregory, we might say that Christians should acknowledge dependence, acknowledge it in its very intensities and learn to construe it as one of the good things about being human. 
More importantly, we might say, Christians should stop construing personal worth as a matter of what one gives for others to receive in a relationship. Yes, reciprocity has its goods, but they are not fundamental to human personhood, which in Christian teaching is a matter of nothing other than being made in the image of the imageless God. Moving to the second, then, resource, which I described as celebration. Because at the center of Christian practice is celebration. There is, so far as I am aware, no other major religious tradition that construes its primary reason for the worship of God as celebration. Christians gather in worship to celebrate the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, that Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Yet celebration is often missing in the lives of persons with disabilities, perhaps especially in the lives of adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Bill Gaventa, chair of the National Collaborative on Faith and Disability, reflects on his own 50-year uh, career. He says, after I became the Protestant chaplain, at the large Newark State School in 1975, I led a number of weekly religious services in different parts of the facility. I soon came to see the basic spiritual needs as celebration and belonging. Celebration meant a sense of identity that had meaning and value as well as the experience of being valued in a place where hundreds of people had been sent because they were devalued by the society into which they had been born. One way to show value was celebrating the image of God in every person and God's love for every person. Besides trying to embody that in my personal relationships and in religious services that focused on God's love and celebrating the lives of my congregation, my first objective means of pastoral care was to structure my pastoral visiting around delivering birthday cards to my Protestant flock. Cards are simple, taken for granted expressions of worth and value to most of us, but they are conspicuous by their absence in large institutions. Who celebrates my birth and creation? Gaventa is, of course, reflecting on his experience of more than 40 years ago. However, the question remains as a fundamental marker of Christian being. Let me suggest that the single most appropriate way to gauge the justice that adheres in social relationships is to answer the question, who celebrates with me? Who celebrates with Ryan? Who celebrates with Sunita? who celebrates with Andrew. And just in case you think, this emphasis on celebration as a matter of social justice is loosey-goosey. Let me point you to 1 Corinthians 11, where the Apostle Paul is adamant that not celebrating with is first to show contempt for those whom God has gathered together, and second, to humiliate those whom you ignore. Lastly, friendship. The most commonly reported desire of parents of children with disabilities is for their child to have a friend. This desire increases as parents and their children age. So typically the wish for a friend is more acute in parents of adult children with disabilities than in parents of young children. It's a good reminder that rights, accessibility, and social inclusion, and even good person-centered planning do not guarantee that you've got a friend. Since almost its inception, the Western philosophical tradition has recognized that friendship is hard. Aristotle thought that most of our friendships are matters of circumstance or convenience. He thought, furthermore, that really being friends with someone is like having a second self. 
And that meant, according to Aristotle, that it's impossible to become friends with someone who is dissimilar to you. While he's hardly the final word on friendship philosophically considered, Aristotle's views are both strikingly forthright and descriptive of many people's experiences today. You become friends with people whom you are like, who evoke in you a mimetic sense of affinity, of desire, and of delight. Your friends are the people in your life whom you would never consider instrumentalizing. Never consider accounting for their presence with you or significance to you as a matter of what you can get out of it. And if you extrapolate just a little bit from your understanding of who your friends are, you can probably sense some of the challenges authentic friendships pose for persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Apart from that obvious challenge of instrumentalization, that is to say, I'm a friend that as an act of generosity to someone in need, which of course tells me more about me than it does about my relationship with them. One other challenge that persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities face with respect to friendship is that they are often infantilized. That is to say, they're treated as eternal children or the language that's sometimes used as holy innocence. And this treatment impedes the growth of friendship not because it means that the person with the disability is never treated as a peer, though that often happens, but rather because it gets in the way of learning what it means to like someone without pretense. Again, however, the Christian tradition provides resources for becoming friends with <coughs> others that enlarge typical assumptions about what it means to be someone's friend. The 13th century Dominican theologian Thomas Aquinas, for instance, suggested that we are created to be nothing less than God's friends. That is to say, that we are created means that we are people whom God likes. Given that God is not a thing of any kind, and that we most certainly are, it's easy to see how Aquinas' view revolutionizes the classical concept of friendship, where you can't be friends with someone who's dissimilar to you. According to Aquinas, our primal experience of friendship, of being liked, is one that depends on difference. It's one for which difference is not an obstacle, but rather friendship's generative source. To paraphrase a contemporary Catholic theologian, James Allison, being created as God's friend means being liked spaciously, being delighted in, wanting to give extension, fulfillment, fruition to, to share in just being. We are missing out on something huge and powerful and serene and enjoyable and safe and meaningful by being caught up in relationships that are less than that. <coughs> by being caught up in relationships that <coughs> fail to mirror this astonishing gentleness of just being liked. If, as I said, who celebrates with me is a fundamental question of social justice, then it is so in part because it helps to answer the question, who likes me? Who is my friend? Please notice again that this account of friendship does not depend on reciprocity. It depends on instead on the much stronger and more continuous recognition that we are all from start to finish and without remainder nothing other than the embodiments of God's grace, of God's liking us. And this unbothered, non-emergency sense of being liked, which in Christian teaching is both our being and our vocation, is profoundly a matter of social justice because it extends to everyone all the time. Justice work 
the kind of justice work demanded by learning to speak of friendship and being liked among the pains. The kind of justice work demanded by thinking through the in-between of disability and healing is never justice work unless it is justice for all work. 